God bless everyone. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter number 8. We are going to continue in this theme of the rise of the prophets as I wrap up our Pentecostal sermons from uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, certainly, I am so excited about this Pentecost season being one defined by a little fires everywhere. And I want you to imagine that your uh, particular uh, uh, cultivating of the gift of prophesying boldly, as Dr. Cornell West uh, wrote in his first book, Prophesy Deliverance, that we are all called in a moment like this to prophesy, uh, to boldly proclaim the word of God. It's worth saying and it's worth noting that uh, when one says, I want you to prophesy or I uh, am prophesying, often we uh, reduce the, the, the gift of prophecy into some futuristic foretelling of someone's uh, 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 boo or house or car, something that is, is, is often limited to their own personal gain. Um, we, we often reduce the ability of one to be moved by the Spirit to prophesy and make it only about the things that are to happen, uh, the predictive element of prophecy. But I want you to know that there's also another form of prophecy that is just as if not more common in the biblical text, and that is the ability to boldly proclaim the word of God. It is about preaching and declaring with boldness, with fearlessness, the truth of God's word. And then there is this 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 uh, reality of prophecy that the prophets have been called to do to the nations, to the nation who has indeed fallen down on their commitments to take the issues of justice and mercy and fairness uh, and institute those in their social, political society. I want you to appreciate there's the predictive element, there's the proclamation, the bold preaching of God's word, but then there's also the truth-telling nature that one speaks truth to power. And so when I and we talk about uh, the rise of the prophets, I want you to imagine that even if you can't tell the future of someone's uh, individual reality, I want you to imagine that God has given you the ability to boldly proclaim God's word. Sometimes that may be through uh, your own story or your own testimony, but you have the ability to boldly proclaim God's word. Or, and you have the ability to speak truth to power as a, 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 a follower of the Most High God. You have the power to boldly speak to the, the agents of systems, oppressions, uh, negations, all of these particular manners uh, whereby people's lives are erased and or minimized, you have the ability through the power of God's spirit to speak that truth in a prophetic manner. So those are the three kind of frameworks I want you to think about as we go through this sermon, because as we come to the text, I find this particular passage in Psalms on the second Sunday of uh, Pentecost to be a powerful declaration of prophesying boldly the word of the Lord. Psalms chapter number eight. We're going to start by reading uh, verse number one. We're going to read, I believe, all nine verses. So uh, turn your attention to Psalms chapter number eight in the name of the Lord. The scripture says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. For you have set your glory in the heavens and through the praise of children and infants, you have silenced the enemy. I want to I switch over to uh, the NRSV version. It says, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth, for you have set your glory above the heavens. And I like how it says in verse number two, out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your 
heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established? What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. Uh, all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever along the paths of the sea, O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I want to talk for the few moments we have here from the topic, prophesy or perish. Prophesy or perish. Bow your heads with us and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. I ask you, Lord, that you will hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. The rise of the prophets part two. We're going to talk today about prophesy or perish. Now, last week we discussed the rise of the prophets and, and, and I found that passage of of, of, of numbers uh, where Moses declares, would that all God's people prophesy. And this week, as we have seen uh, the day of Pentecost in, 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 a, in a fascinating manner, the spirit of, of prophesying seemed to have overwhelmed the country because all across this country, they said in all 50 states last week, there were protests. There were people outside boldly proclaiming the injustice related to the indiscriminate killing and brutality of black, brown, and now even white folk and Asian folk. Every single color of the hue is now getting the opportunity to see how violence at the hands of the state is all too easy to be unleashed among us as a people. We find and we have found that the rise of the prophets have indeed sparked a massive uh, international response. That people in even other countries are beginning to to, to uh, 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 arise to this, this, this moment. And, and you even find folk in England and folk in China and folk in, in, in parts of the continent all standing up and saying, in this moment, what does it mean to push back against the violence that is delivered against God's people and creation? I want you to appreciate that this moment, the rise of the prophets, is not a moment that you and I should allow to pass us by. For as we are people of Pentecost, we love the passage, Joel chapter 2, where the scripture says that in the last day, God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. You've heard me say it all the time here. Everybody say all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. That means all the, the gender dynamics that we would like to put in play, the sexism that we would like to have working among us to determine who has the ability or the validation to prophesy. The spirit levels the playing field. When it says that your young men shall dream dreams and your old men shall see visions, oh, it validates the youth and it validates the elders. It makes us uh, have to struggle with this reality that Ageism cannot be a disqualifying factor for who God's spirit will be poured out among. When we talk about the slaves and the servants and the handmaidens, it talks about class and it talks about people's social location. That no matter where you're situated in the world, that God's spirit does not discriminate. That if you make yourself available, God said, I will pour out my spirit. And then the scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, which means that anybody you don't like, you think who is beneath you, the scripture reminds us that it is never up to you or I Whew. to be able to determine who gets to benefit 
Who gets to experience the Spirit of God? As we go through the consecration, child of God, as we go through this season of social unrest, I want you to know this is an opportunity for you and I to ask the Lord, Lord, pour out your Spirit on me so I can prophesy rather than perish. I want you to know that the prophesying that's happened is powerful, but it also is doing a thing as I was looking on the TV and reading uh, some materials that now everybody is wanting to chime in on the, 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 the catalyzing incidents that made the prophesying even necessary. Because now everybody is prophesying, everybody's out in the streets, everybody's trying to get in on the good thing. And while that's okay, I want you to appreciate that as we prophesy, we must not allow the, the, the privileged and the elite and even those who claim to be our champions but have been mute all up until this moment to try to fill in and act like they are on our side. I mean, you know, I remember I was in a meeting with some former Obama officials some years ago, and they had just came out of the uh, White House, and we were in a meeting in New York with Harry Belafonte and, and uh, uh, some other folks, and we were sitting around a table, and we were talking about uh, what does this next iteration of our work look like? And one of the, the officials said, well, you, I want you to know that I am just like you. I am part of the rebellion. You know, and I kind of scratched my head. You know, I'm, I'm one of the more radical guys that sits at these kind of tables, and I, I, I talk before I think when I'm when I ready to tell somebody the truth. And, man, I, I don't always have a good filter. And I said, well, I think it's fascinating that, that, that yesterday you were running the empire, and today you are part of the rebellion. I said, I, I, I think, I think if, you have, if you have left your power seat in the empire, you have to at least ask we who are leading the rebellion. Uh, are, you, are, are you now able to, to come and join the rebellion? But you don't get to walk out of the empire uh, uh, state room and then plop down and say, now I'm in charge of the rebellion. It don't work like that. <laughs> Somebody say Amen. You got, you got to pay some dues up in here. You got to demonstrate that you did not internalize the, the, the nature of the empire, the priorities of the empire, the ways of the empire. And I want you to know, child of God, that there are people right now, as the rise of the prophets are happening, they are wanting to profit off of our pain. They want to ask for reform when we need a revolution. They want to put a wet blanket on the fire of your resistance. They want to march with the police and kneel with the police. When in this moment, we want to disarm the police and we want to defund the police. I don't want you and I, as the prophets rise up, to get confused about the oppressors who are still hanging around. Yeah, that, that works in your own life, too. Because there are some folk, as you rise up, they, they, they see you rising and they're a little worried. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen if you stand straight up? Because as Dr. King said, you can only be on my back if I'm bent over. But when I stand up. I wish I had some folk that was willing to stand up today. You ought to, you ought to just type in, the, in your chat, I'm getting ready to stand up. Hey, man, I'm getting ready to stand up. I will not allow folk to try to try to try to steal the prophetic unction the prophetic impulse that is being unleashed among us and i i need y'all to pray for for folk like me and others because you and i we are we are dealing with a an empire a, a force a state that loves to to like a shapeshifter manipulate itself like a chameleon, they they wanna they wanna parrot your your ideas. Not everybody's saying Black Lives Matter, and I think that's great that you saying it. They paint it on the on the ground in Washington D.C. I think that's great, 
But what about the unhoused loved ones who still are living on that street where you've painted Black Lives Matter? What about the racial profiling that's still going to happen on that street that you printed Black Lives Matter? What about the tear gassing and the arresting of protesters and nonviolent folk that are going to get, get their heads cracked on the boulevard now that says Black Lives Matter? God help us. God help us. Because right now, as the conversation is rolling out, the prophets are rising. The truth is being told. And there's a spectrum of what we want as it relates to this new world, this new vision. Some folk are saying we want to abolish the police. Then you got other folks saying, well, that's too harsh. Why don't we defund the police? Then you got other folks are saying, oh, that's still too, too, too radical. Why don't we reform the police? And then you got other folks, some folk who seem to be tongue talking, Bible believing folk who just say, why don't black folk just stop committing crime? I'm trying to say to myself, we got all kind of a spectrum. Abolish the police, defund the police, reform the police, and black people just stop committing so much crime. I'm here to tell you, the rise of the prophets should never find itself on the most conservative, the most uh, 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 limiting and exclusive part of the spectrum. When the prophets arise, you got to be worried about all flesh. And I pray that as you rise up, as we rise up, that we remember that our ability to prophesy is what will keep you and I from perishing. Because as I think it was uh, Maya Angelou or, or, or Zora Neale Hurston or uh, one of those women as folks said, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. And I want you to know I don't want one politician who claims to be a Democrat or a progressive. I don't want uh, no white folk, no black folk, no brown folk, no Asian folk, no polka dot folk. I don't want no rich folk, no poor folk, no educated folk, no uneducated folk to come through here into your life and put a wet blanket on the rise of the prophetic power that is rising up all around you. You ought to just put that in the chat. You ain't gonna put a wet blanket on my prophesying. I'm about to tell the truth. So help me to the Lord. Can you imagine when all the folk in your ancestry, in your background, regardless of your race and culture, when your people were struggling to be free, they were told, oh, that's too radical. Some folk were told that. Harriet Tubman, some folk told her, girl, are you crazy? You, man, you got it good over here. You get three square meals a day. You only get your back cracked a few times. Why are you, why are you, why are you pushing things so hard? I want you to know, child of God, that it is not, it is not, it is not our responsibility to uphold systems of oppression. I have so many people telling me stuff like, oh, McBride, you're talking about abolishing the police and defunding the police. What's going to happen when it's gone? I said, that's the work for us to do. The work for us to do is to create the new world, not uphold the world as it is. And this is why I love this passage today, because Psalms chapter number eight, it starts out with a bold declaration. Oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory is above the heavens. I want you to imagine and know, child of God, that one of the first things that is required for you and I who will prophesy or perish is we must remember that our imagination fuels the prophets. Come on, say that. My imagination fuels the prophets. Say that again. My imagination fuels the prophets. I love how the scripture starts off with the grandiosity and the majesty of the Lord our God who gives us the spirit to prophesy. See, when you start from above, when you start with a radical focus on the beauty and the transcendent nature of God who created everything and the justice that flows from this God, the enough that flows from this God, the abundance that flows from this God. When your eyes are focused on that, you don't get boxed into the limitation of other people's imagination. If God's majesty is great, then your imagination must be just as great. 
If God's imagination is powerful, then your imagination must be powerful. I love how Michael Ray Matthews, he says, if you are not cultivating your own imagination, you are living in someone else's. I'm going to say that again. If you are not cultivating your own imagination, you are living in someone else's imagination. And I want you to know, child of God, there are a whole lot of folk around you that want to keep you locked into their imagination. They want to keep your mind reduced to the finitude of their mind. They want to keep your ideas uh, limited to the, the, the narrow uh, uh, categories of their mind. They want you to, to, to be a prophet, but just don't prophesy about that. <laughs> don't prophesy about that. Don't prophesy about the economy. Prophesy to me about my house. Prophesy to me about my boo. Prophesy to me about how I can get rich. But don't tell me the truth about the reason you can't get rich is because we got a capitalistic economy. Don't tell me the truth about the reason why your relationships don't seem to work out is because you got too much trauma. Don't tell me about all the reasons why things are the way that they are. Just keep telling me what I want to hear. Don't you know, child of God, that there are people who are prophets and there are other people who are profiteers. And when you are a profiteer, you don't have an imagination for the things that are to come. You have an imagination about how can you keep getting what you already have. And that's why I love how imaginations, they fuel profits. They fuel people's ability to see those things that are not as though they are. Just take a, take a look at how children, when they're taught, we got all kind of educators up in our church. And you read the, the way that education is being critiqued and being reimagined by some of our foremost uh, minds here in this church. Dr. Farima and Dr. Tiffany, and of course, none greater or better than Dr. Uh, Cherise, amen. All of them are talking about all these ways that the education is, 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 is radically being transformed and changed. And it's fascinating because they say that often the educational systems are based on, on models of the 1900s where they're just trying at that time to get you to comply and to get you to, to, to take in information so you can be a robot in their factory manufacturing kind of paradigm. And, and, and it's a small thing, but it's a crazy thing how, you know, kids are taught to color in between the lines. Because if you don't color in between the lines, then what you are, are creating is unintelligible. But what if what you are creating is exactly what needs to be created? That the un unintelligibility of the vision that God has given you is exactly what's needed in your life and in your family's life and in the community's life. Let your imagination flow. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow, because it is your imagination that will help you to be able to have the fuel. You need to be a prophet. Don't allow people to force you to think that you got to color inside the lines when your imagination is trying to help you be turned loose. And that's what we need. When the prophets, as the prophets arise, elected officials are going to try to tell you to keep coloring inside the lines. You're going to go to the police commission and they're going to tell you, oh, you can't defund the cops. They're going to go and tell you, oh, you can't abolish the police. They're going to go to tell you, oh, we can't bring the cops out of the schools. Don't let nobody tell you what we can't do. Because your imagination is needed in your family, in your house, in your relationship, on your job, in your career. As you keep moving, let your imagination prophesy so you won't perish under the weight of the kind of systems that want to suck you dry. Oh, so what are some questions? Well, in order for your imagination to be fueled, I want to submit that you got to be a rabid learner. You got to read. You got to study. So what are you reading? What voices are you listening to? What experiences are you excavating? What practices are you leaning into that cultivate your imagination? Who's 
whose imagination do you need to get out of? As, as Michael Ray says, some of us are living in somebody else's imagination. You got to get some folk out of your mind. Some of us have internalized other people's imagination about our worth. We've internalized other people's imagination about our value. We've internalized other people's imagination about what is possible. Get those folk out of your mind and tell yourself, my imagination is about to match the majestic nature of God, the transcendent power of God. I got a big imagination, and I believe God's going to give me what I need, give us what we need to see the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, the second thing that you and I must be mindful of if we are going to be people who are will prophesy and perish or perish is that, listen, your voice is the vehicle for the prophet. Your voice is your vehicle. Verse number two says, out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark, a defense. You found a place where God can set up shop and build you the fortification you need so you will not be overrun by the opposition. Let me tell you this. When you speak out and use your voice, you will have opposition. People are going to push back. They're going to tell you all these reasons why it won't happen, why it can't happen. I don't know if you've ever had someone in your life, and every time you try to speak up, they try to push back on your voice. They try to tell you that you weren't educated enough. They try to tell you that you didn't have enough this, and, and your ideas were too outside the mainstream. Don't you know the, the mainstream used to be out of the mainstream? <laughs> Amen. The mainstream don't never stay the same. Things are always changing and updating. Can you imagine if you never got an update on your phone or on your computer, how your thing would just be stuck in the caching, continuously being frozen by the weight and the complexity of the flowing of information? I want you to know, child of God, that it's time for you to allow your voice to help upgrade your family, upgrade the society, upgrade our culture, upgrade our neighborhood. Use your voice. Speak out boldly and let the, the voice that God has given you come forward. I just appreciate in this moment how these young people are from different races and backgrounds are all allowing their voice to become a symphony. Last week, we had the opportunity to be outside, and this young person from Pastor Zach Carey's church, a true vine, called a rally, and he thought, he said about 60 to 100 people would be there, and 5, 10, as high as 15,000 people came out. And they marched down the street playing Lil Bootsy and Martin Luther King Jr. and, and, and Fannie Lou Hamer and, and all these chants all at the same time. Oh, it was a Pentecostal symphony for justice. And I want you to know your voice is unique in that it can speak to certain people in ways that other voices can't penetrate. Your voice is necessary in this moment. Your voice must be used in this moment. Don't sink back and shrink back because you may not be able to speak to the kind of folk that others can. You have a unique voice. And you got to help make sense of everything that is happening in the lives around us. If you are a therapist, guess what? Your voice is needed. All this trauma, all this hurt, all this pain out here. We need folk who have the gift of being able to use your voice and help people be healed. Prophet, rise up as a healer. You who are educators, you know we need your voice. Because we got all kind of propaganda. We got all kind of folk who claim to be for freedom, but seem to love chains and bondage too much. You can't be a freedom fighter and trying to keep in place the system that has been oppressing people for 400 years. Step aside and just admit, you know what, I'm really not that. Step aside and say, you know what, the time, the train has passed me by. 
Step aside. I'm not telling you to get off the train. Just go sit on a back cart and let us carry you into the promised land. God help all you preachers out here who want to march with the police and get all comfortable with the police when the police a minute later will come and crack you upside your head if you don't act right. I'm here to tell you I'm not against the police. I'm trying to help the police by abolishing the police. I'm not against the police. I'm trying to help the police by defunding the police. I'm I'm not against the police. I'm trying to help the police by freeing you from the practice that requires you to use violence on God's people. Don't you know if we got to use violence to preserve peace? There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. And I don't mean no harm because I know everybody feel like they got to respond the way they got to respond. But let me tell you like this. If a police officer got a warrant to come arrest Pastor Mike or arrest any of you and, and, and the judge told that police, you go arrest McBride, I don't care what he's doing. And they walk through the door right now and I'm up here preaching. The police officer will not say, oh, but you know, Pastor McBride is such a great guy. Oh, you know, Pastor McBride, you know, he, he's, he's trying to help the people and do the right thing. Oh, Pastor McBride, you know, he, he, he helped me out that one time when, when I was in trouble. No, I be... Right while I'm preaching. So I'm trying to figure out why are you more loyal to the police officer who will come and arrest you out your pulpit. And you can't get next to these young people who are out here fighting for your freedom and the freedom of your children and the freedom of your grandchildren and the freedom of your aunties and your uncles. They're fighting for the ancestors who did not make it to this moment to be able to see the rising of the prophets. No, the devil is a lie. I will not be loyal to an empire where God has called me to be loyal to the kingdom of God. Lord, I feel like preaching today. I want you to know, child of God, your voice is your vehicle. So you may not be out there in the march. That's fine. I believe these protests is for young people anyway. Shoot, they be telling me, McBride, why you not out there? Because I'm old. <laughs> I'm old. I can't, I, I can't run like I used to run. My voice goes out too fast. I got to lose 100 more pounds before I get back out there in that protest. But I'm going to cheer these young people on. And if they call me and they really need me, I'm going to take my tail out there with a neck and a back problem and a back and a neck problem. And I'm going to do my best to stand with them. And I want you to use your voice the same way. Call your elected official. Call your principal. Call your police chief. Call your mayor. And let your voice be used to ensure that we don't perish why would we sit here and die when we have an opportunity woo, to follow the procession? This is a once in a lifetime moment. Don't you think these protests and this uprising will last in perpetuity? They always have a shelf life. So don't compromise. Don't settle for eight can't wait. Eight can wait. We don't got to settle for reform when we have the opportunity for radical transformation oh so what are the questions that I want you to think about how can you use your voice to prophesy deliverance freedom healing love joy and peace and who needs to hear your voice just like the babes and the infants are proclaiming in a way that allows God to set up a bulwark or a defense. Who needs to hear your voice so God can set up a defense within their life? Lord, help us to use our voice. Oh, I'm going to stop there because I want us to have time for communion. But I just want you, child of God, to know that this is an opportunity for you and I to prophesy. Boldly proclaim the word of the Lord. Don't settle 
Woo, please don't settle. I, I, I remember a, a, a story in, 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 in uh, I think it was second or first Kings when the king of Aram was, was trying to figure out uh, what exactly they needed to do in order to defeat this enemy that was, was, was raising up against them. And the king of Israel, in his d- dismay, he, he consulted the prophet. And the prophet, listen to this, told the king, shoot your arrow out of this this window and wherever it lands I want you to get the arrow and I want you to hit the ground so the prophet shoots the arrow or the king shoots the arrow and they go and find the 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 arrows and and when they get out there the prophet says now pick up these arrows and bang the ground with it the king picks up the arrows bangs the ground one two three times and stops and the prophet said why did you stop I told you to bang the ground with the arrow I didn't tell you how many times so since you stopped at three that will be the ceiling of your deliverance child of God may we not settle right now Don't stop at three when you have an unlimited ceiling of deliverance and possibility that can flow through your faithfulness, through your prophecy, your bold proclamation of God's truth in your family, in our community, in your own self. Don't settle. Don't stop at three. Keep in that ground until you get what you need. Keep going back for more until you are exhausted. Don't saddle when God says, I've not put a ceiling on you. Oh, the sky is the limit to what I can have. Just believe and receive it. God will perform it today, today, today. Good old Clark sister song says, I'm looking for a miracle. Come on, let's bow your heads and let's pray for a few moments. God, I pray that we as a people will prophesy so we will not perish. Help us, Lord God, to boldly proclaim your word so we can indeed speak truth to power, so we can help put the imagination of your work in the world and in the universe for it to happen. And Lord, I and we carry within us, Lord God, some anxiety and worry around this moment. The coronavirus is still at work and people are still contracting it and getting sick and some are still dying. Lord, some of us, Lord, are dealing with financial difficulties and, and, and we hear this word today of, 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 of being able to prophesy or perish. And some are saying, what does this have to do with my life? I pray, God, that you will help them to see that even as they go through their own trials and tribulations, they have the ability to boldly proclaim, God, that you are going to make all things work out. Things are going to be well. I may not see it. I may not know it. But I will prophesy with my voice. God, that I and we will not perish, Lord, and we will live to see your goodness in the land of the living. And so, God, I pray right now, have your way. Save, Lord God, and heal and deliver. If you're here and you're watching and you want some special prayer, you need someone to touch and agree with you, I just dare you right now just to lift your hands right where you are. Our ministers, they're right here. They're on the chat. And even though we may not be able to see you, we are going to pray for you right now. Our ministers are praying. Some of our small group members, our leaders are praying. We're praying for you. Put in the chat, Lord, I need you to give me uh, the ability to prophesy so I won't perish. I need you, God, to help my voice to be found and recovered in this moment. I need my imagination to be expanded so it does not be shrunk into, Lord God, something so small that it can't even hold my future, dare I even say my present. God, let me be a prophet that rises to the occasion. And Lord, I know it shall and it can be done. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.